Hi there folks, Carl James here from Electric Media Madness, joining me for another Strange Tales. Today I'm going to go down a little bit of a rabbit hole again with Stanley Kubrick and specifically the film A Clockwork Orange. And this idea that the film alludes to mind control. For those people who want to look into the subject of mind control, there is a huge amount of literature out there, specifically in the alternative knowledge research domain. But one of the subjects that comes up quite a lot is MK Ultra, and this was a CIA largely led uh, project. It was an umbrella project with 149 sub projects, and they dealt with illegal and unsolicited testing of drugs, also states of consciousness, uh, implementation of electronic components. Some experiments involved uh, remote activation and control of living organisms. So it was all kinds of mind control that was going on here as well as other types of uh, experimentation it seemed to start around about 1953 something like that and this subject came into the public domain in 1973 there was a commission to bring the information out into the public domain and Richard Helms then the director of the CIA decided to destroy and shred all of the documentation we say all oh, there is still quite a bit of information out there hence the reason why we know as much as we do today and also because there's many people who were involved with uh, MK Ultra experimentation who've come forward and talked about it not only them but also people who've actually worked on it you know there's a lot of debate out there about how successful it was I always maintain that if something was not particularly successful why did it go on for decades and decades that's what was my argument but again there's a lot of information out there available but let's get into the subject of Stanley Kubrick and A Clockwork Orange because A Clockwork Orange for all intents and purposes is a film about mind control uh, state-sponsored mind control actually so December 19th 1971 the film was released in America less than four years before the spectre of MK Ultra came into the public domain so you know there it is out there even before this information is becoming readily available to the masses. Uh, the film was released in the UK shortly after, I think it was January 13th, something like that, 1972, and it squarely tackles this idea of free will versus state control. But the specifics of the film are about morality, the dynamics of state sponsored behavioural modification, and the central character of Alex is where we see this story being played out him and his gang of droogs. Uh, Pete, Georgie, and Dim, I think they're called, and they are violent sociopathic delinquents. Alex has got this interest in classical music and sexually assaulting people and this thing they term ultra violence and they go out there and they just create chaos in their wake and no concern for the implications the repercussions of it whatsoever. But eventually he does get caught and he, he's taken to prison and in order to get his sentence reduced he decides to put himself up for this experimental project, which is called the Ludovico Technique. It's an attempted rehabilitation by controversial psychological conditioning, basically. And that's where we really, where the, the themes of mind control are really, really brought out in the film. And there was a lot of debate about what the film was really trying to say and do at the time. Kubrick rarely said much about his films, but he did say a few bits and pieces about Clockwork Orange in the Saturday Review, which I think it was 1972. I'll read this out from here. He, he called it the film a social satire dealing with the question of whether behavior psychology and psychological conditioning are dangerous new weapons for a totalitarian government to use to impose vast controls on its citizens and turn them into little more than robots. And Kubrick knew a lot about this subject. He was well educated, but he was well read, but he also had a lot of friends. I mean, included amongst his friends were the likes of uh, B.F. Skinner, who was a specialist in the aforementioned fields, and the likes of Margaret Mead as well. And we have a lot of connections there to things like the Tavistock Institute. And that really is where we go down the rabbit hole. Let's just look at people like John Watson and B.F. Skinner for a second. And you like Skinner, for example, his eponymous boxes and the practice of uh, operant conditioning. And they are effectively made manifest through the film's Deus Ex Machina, which is uh, the Ludovico Technique. And people have suggested that the Ludovico Technique existed outside of the narrative framework of the film. In other words, it existed in a real world domain for all intents and purposes, in all, all but in name alone. And this was dismissed as nothing more than a parody of aversion therapy at the time. But again, don't forget that Kubrick had a lot of friends in these circles, you know, he had social psychology and all that kind of thing. Uh, Stanford Research Institute was another place where he had connections to. Um, obviously, Tavistock Institute mentioned uh, the CIA as well and things like that. So what I wanted to do really was just dip into some of that. But I also want to go to uh, the original source of the film, which is the book, Anthony Burgess's 1962 novella of the same name, Clock of Orange, because that book provided Kubrick with much of the source material for the film. And there's this interesting article by a chap called Paul Gallagher entitled Anthony Burgess and the Top Secret Code in a Clockwork Orange. 
and it discusses some of the insight into the and the possible connections uh, that Burgess may have had with the practice of state-sponsored mind control. And the principal research source for this article is this chap called Roger Lewis. He wrote this highly controversial and in some cases highly dubious biography of Burgess called Anthony Burgess. But there are some highlights which raise some very, very important questions. One of which is a meeting between Anthony Burgess and alleged British Secret Service agent. And the agent allegedly told Lewis that Burgess was not totally responsible for writing A Clockwork Orange and it was actually the British Secret Service that played a significant role in the authorship of this book. Make of that what you will. According to Roger Lewis, his contact said that, quoted from the book actually, I'll read this out to you, mind control experimentation conducted by Dr. Ewan McCameron at the Allen Memorial Institute in Montreal between 1957 and 1963 and remote neural monitoring facility that operated out of Fort Meade uh, the CIA were funding controversial research programs into electronic brain stimulation. They induced exhaustion and nightmares in the patients, put hoods or cones over people's heads to broadcast voices directly into their brain. They irradiated the auditory cortex or inner ear. When patients had their own speech played back to them incessantly, they went insane. Sounds like Alex and the Clockwork Orange. Uh, there was a misuse of civilians in these covert operations and intelligence on these devices remains classified. So let's jump to the 2013 article, Anthony Burgess and the top secret code in Clockwork Orange. Paul Gallagher added, according to Lewis, Burgess had been a low grade collector of intelligence data or ground observer in the Far East for the British. On return to England, he found himself in a world of spy scandals, Burgess, Philby and McLean and double agents, George Blake where American cousins were questioning their bond with the Brits. A plan was hatched where Burgess would essentially front a novel that would lift the corner of the carpet and put into his novel classified material about the then newfangled conditioning experiments and aversion therapies being devised to reform criminals. Experiments which had wider implications for the concept of social engineering. So Roger Lewis's Secret Service contact allegedly named one Howard Roman, uh, who's a language expert and former CIA officer. He's cited has been the collaborator with Burgess on a Clockwork Orange novella and in the book Anthony Burgess Lewis maintained uh, allegedly prompted by his contact that there was a secret code hidden in a Clockwork Orange and this is what he said the capitalized lines on page 29 of a Clockwork Orange give the HQ location of psychotronic warfare technology the name of the establishment is Fort Bliss the word bliss appears on page 29 of Burgess's novel no less than six times. Now that doesn't come as much of a surprise for me if we're going to follow that train of thought because Fort Bliss crops up a fair bit in mind control literature. Uh, at the very least I find it telling that in 1945 there was over a hundred of these um, Nazi paperclip scientists that were brought over to, and they were stationed at Fort Bliss, and they accounted for about 7% of all of the paperclip Nazis that were officially brought into the US as a result of, of uh, Operation Paperclip. So can it be a coincidence that every paperclip scientist and engineer employed by the US in the field of rocketry, there were equally as many that were brought to America for pharmacology, biology, psychiatry, psychology, behavioural modification, uh, mind control for military and intelligence agencies. So it's interesting. The, the Fort Bliss connection there is interesting. Make of that what you will. And Gallagher's article also noticed that one of Burgess's most harsh critics, who's Blake Morrison was his name, actually appeared to corroborate some of the aforementioned in this 2002 article for The Guardian Online called uh, Kingdom of the Wicked. And the following is taken from that article. He says, the espionage theory comes courtesy of a retired security official who approached Lewis and told him a clockwork orange is full of secret code names and encrypted locations. Oddly enough, a retired security official once told the same story. Perhaps there's something in it, but Lewis can offer no other evidence. And the likelihood of someone as valuable, indiscreet and hell raising as Burgess being recruited by MI5 stretches credulity. Lewis nonetheless seems to believe that espionage made Burgess rich and the darkest secret haunting him to the end. So at this point, when we're talking about CIA mind control and that, we talk about the LSD involvement, which was organized and distributed no less by the CIA uh, as part of the counterculture um, psychedelic movement of the 1960s. It's interesting that we, I mean, this was before A Clockwork Orange, but you have 2001 A Space Odyssey, which brought out, did well, but didn't do hugely well. And then all of a sudden the film has a resurgence because people were going in and taking LSD and whatever and watching the film and having this counterculture experience. 
from the film. Again, we talk about Kubrick's connections. There's a number of people that Kubrick were allegedly connected to with, with connections to the CIA. There's this one chap called David Sylvester, goes over to the US in the 19, in 1960 as a recipient of this State Department grant. Uh, the following is taken from this article by James Finch, 2015. David Sylvester, a British critic in New York, and it says, in the 1960s encounter, found itself at the center of a scandal when it emerged that the magazine, which was ostensibly funded by Anti-Communist Congress for Cultural Freedom, was in fact financed by the CIA. Neither Sylvester nor the magazine's British co-editor, Stephen Spender, however, admitted to any knowledge of this arrangement. Kubrick and Sylvester got on well, and while Sylvester was in Los Angeles, Kubrick also invited him to dinner and showed him around Universal Studios. They went on to become good friends, culminating in Sylvester working in an uncredited role as a special writer on Kubrick's 1961 film adaption of Lolita. And there's another chap as well, uh, Alfred Hubbard, who, according to some sources, allegedly introduced Stanley Kubrick to LSD. He was a key player in the CIA's LSD distribution network. He was a high level official in the CIA's immediate predecessor organization, the, the OSS. And there's a degree of evidence suggesting that he was actually involved with the Manhattan Project as well. But Kubrick always maintained that he was against LSD. And there's this uh, taken from the book, Stanley Kubrick interviews, conversations with filmmakers. Kubrick actually said, one of the things that turned me against LSD is interesting. He says, turned me against. Does that mean he was always against it from the beginning? So maybe he had dabbled in it at some point. But let's go back to the article anyway. That turned me against LSD is that all the people I know who use it have a peculiar inability to distinguish between things that are really interesting and stimulating and things that appear to be in a state of universal bliss that the drug induces on a good trip. They seem to completely lose their critical faculties and disengage themselves from some of the most stimulating areas of life. Perhaps when everything is beautiful, nothing is beautiful. So make of that what you will. There's a lot of discussion out there about what Kubrick knows. I firmly believe, and I have a lot of evidence of that, that Kubrick knew a hell of a lot about a lot of esoteric subjects, a lot of alternative knowledge subjects, and he mer metaphorically alluded to them in his films. M almost all of his films are a commentary in some form, uh, whether it be just something a little bit less uh, esoteric, you know, commenting on the military industrial complex in films like uh, Doctor Strange Love, Full Metal Jacket, uh, Paths of Glory, uh, alluding to all kinds of things in 2001 A Space Odyssey, alluding to the elite types in Barry Lyndon. Again, uh, way, way down the rabbit hole with Eyes Wide Shut. Um, so why shouldn't uh, A Clockwork Orange be saying something about mind control? I think it speaks for itself. But I will leave that one for you to decide. I hope you've enjoyed this video. If you have, please like, share, subscribe, all that good stuff that YouTube doesn't like, but it really helps people on YouTube and it helps with the algorithms. If you're interested in alternative knowledge research subjects, you might like checking out some of my books. They're available on Amazon in paperback and ebook format. The links to which are in the description for this video. Thank you so much for watching. Uh, take care and I'll see you in soon. Bye bye for now.